uh, chronicle condition, and I'm believing he will. And I'm excited to preach the word tonight because I love the word. Um, it's a lamp into my feet, a light into my path. It's so exciting, and the word tonight is, it's not my word like fire. And that's what I want to share on tonight, that I believe God has a specific word for us that's going to um, ignite us and encourage us to get into the word. So, Lord, tonight I yield to you. I humbly come, Father, having prepared, prayed, fasted, Lord, that you will be seen, that your word will come forth in power and anointing, and that, Lord, by your spirit, you will change us. By your spirit, you will make us, draw us into your word in a greater dimension so that we will come to know you so much more. Glorify your name in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Picture with me, you're a Christian living in North Korea. You're caught with a Bible, you will likely go to prison, and you will be there for many, many years, and you do hard labor also. And I pray for Christians around the world that are going through terrible persecution. You would go out in a boat far from the land, and you would dig out your Bible to read it. You can't read it around people. You'd have to go way out and, and read that. If you're caught reading the Bible, they could be sentenced to 15 years of labor in a camp or worse. They've heard awful stories of what's happened to Christians living in camps. And when another boat approaches, they are cautious, but a man in, in the other boat greets them in the name of Jesus. They have only a few Bibles among them that are worn and falling apart. They are prized possessions, and they risk their lives for them. So when the stranger pulls out a box of new Bibles provided by World Health donors, there's an immediate celebration, you can imagine. They clutch God's words in their chest, and some break into tears, you know. The man takes the damaged Bibles back to the hotel where he was working and hid them. Soon afterward, they disappeared because the janitor took those very worn, damaged Bibles to a small Bible study home, and they were desperately praying for Bibles in that place. Isn't that awesome? In that place. But while they delight in the Bible and treasure it and have so few Bibles, we here in America have Bibles all through our house. Most of us have quite a few Bibles, you know. And, and most Americans, only 14% of the population use the Bible daily. This was a statistic a few years ago. I'm not even sure if it's that many now. And 8% use it one per week. You know, even a lot of believers do not read the Bible. So you can see there's a huge difference in our culture and our value of God's word compared to them. So tonight, I want to let us hear the word of the Lord, and let's see what God is speaking to us through the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, what God is saying about his word. Let's hear the word of the Lord, how Jeremiah depicts how God desires a close relationship with his people who have turned to idols and false prophets. And he says, among the prophets of Samaria, I saw something disgusting. They prophesied by Baal and led my people of Israel astray. Among the prophets of Jerusalem, I also saw a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. These are the prophets. They strengthen the hands of evildoers, and none turn back his back on evil. Sounds like some in America, right? And they are like Sodom. Listen to what God says to me. And Jerusalem's residents are like Sodom and Gomorrah referring to the horrible Sodom and Gomorrah where there was terrible homosexuality. So there's a very strong words God is saying. This is what the Lord of hosts says. Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesied you. They are making you worthless. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the Lord's mouth. So we dare not speak of our own mind. What does it mean to speak prophetically? It means to speak the heart and mind of God. And to know the heart and mind of God takes a lot of concentrated prayer and time in the word. That's what that means. So God, my first point is God saying, who has stood in the counsel of the Lord? Or who has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and hear his word? Who paid attention to his word and obeyed it, he said. And he's adamantly declaring that you want to hear the word and you have to pay attention to what he's saying through the prophets, the real prophet. So this is God saying, listen up. Who has stood in my counsel? Who has come to confer with me and meet with me and know my heart and mind? You see, and he said through the prophet Amos, Indeed, the Lord God does nothing without revealing his counsel to his servants, the prophets. So are we hearing the word of the Lord this day? We're living in very dark times. We need to be more motivated than ever 
to hear God's word and what he's speaking through the prophets. And this is God's counsel. Am I a God who is only near? This is the Lord's declaration. And not a God who is far off. Oh, can a man hide himself in his secret places where I cannot see him? Do not I feel heaven and earth? So God is saying to them, you know, it's important to know me, to know who I am. See, when we read the word, and he's talking about his character here too. You know, who is this God? He's not far away. He can see you anywhere. And do not I feel heaven and earth? See, the word reveals the character of God. And that's one of the main reasons you want to read the word. It tells you who God is. And it tells you how he works. And it tells you his attributes. And that's what God is saying here. The false prophets in Israel were prophesying in God's name. But none of it was true. They were speaking for God. And God was lamenting over this because nothing they said was true. And yet they were deceiving and leading a lie. And so God adamantly says again, this is what the Lord of hosts says. Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy. They are making you worthless. They speak visions from their own mind, not from the Lord's mouth. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord has said you will have peace. They have said to everyone who follows the stubbornness of his heart, no harm will come to you. But that was not true. That was not what God was saying through the prophet Jeremiah. It was something totally opposite. So he was very angry that these prophets were speaking for him, but they were speaking lies. They were speaking lies. And he was confronting them and saying, don't you dare talk like this and do this, giving them false hope. Because the false hope was that they could overcome Nebuchadnezzar and they would have peace and live happily ever after. And that is not what God spoke. That was not what he was saying. He was judging them. He was calling them out for their terrible idolatry. And he was very angry at them. So he was coming and saying, this is my word. This is what I'm saying. How dare you speak for me, the I am that I am. So even in our day, we have people with humanistic philosophy speaking. They're not speaking the word of the Lord. Even some from our pulpits are not speaking the word of the Lord. They call evil good and good evil. There is no truth. It's their truth. How dare we speak our opinions and values if it doesn't line up to God's word. Let me tell you, there is no truth but this. This is the truth. And brothers and sisters, you need this and I need this more than we've ever needed it. We're living in a lot of lies, a lot of deception. This country has so fraught with lies and deception. We don't even know what to believe when we turn on the news. It's pathetic. It really is pathetic. But we know this word is true and we can take it to the bank. And this is an hour. Hear me. This is an hour that we must be in God's word. This is a desperate desperate time that we must it's not okay to abort babies and call it pro-choice versus pro-life we're we're having a fit over these children that died of course we are grieving terribly but we've killed 62 billion in the womb since Roe versus Wade where is the grief over that tolerating kindergarten children should be taught transgender and sex changes there's no heaven or hell eat drink and be merry and the deception and lure of a love of money which I recently preached on Preachers and teachers who want to just speak words that entice people and make them happy and tell them how to live good, but they're not giving them the whole counsel of God. We have a responsibility as we give in this pulpit to speak the whole counsel of God. So God is saying, who is standing in the counsel of the Lord? He said, I did not send these prophets, and yet they ran with a message. I did not speak to them, and yet they prophesied. And he's not sending everybody today that's running with a message. Amen. So you must be discerning. You must be keen. You must be in prayer. You must hear the word of the Lord. You must know the word yourself. Not everybody speaking today is speaking the word of the Lord. They're speaking out of themselves. If they had stood in the counsel of God, said he's very frustrated, then they would have, I would have enabled my people to hear my words. So, behold, I'm against the prophets who use their own tongues to make a declaration. I'm against those who prophesy false dreams and tell them and cause my people to err and go astray when their lies by their vain boasting and recklessness. He said, when I did not send them or command them, nor do they profit this people at all, says the Lord. So God is angry. He's really drawing a line with what is his word and what is not his word. And he said, these prophets are filling the Jewish people with vain hopes that are not true. They are not going to overcome Nebuchadnezzar, and they're not going to have peace. They're not, because God is judging them for their idolatry. And God will judge us for our idolatry here, too, believe me. He hates Idolatry, God hates it. So he accused these prophets of perverting the word of God and speaking falsely in his name. 
How ridiculous and insulting to speak lies and mislead God's people. Consider how you would feel if someone was influencing your children to disobey you with false hopes and lies. Think about how that would feel. That's how God felt. These prophets were trying to come. His people that he had brought out of Egypt, that he had led through the wilderness, that he loved so deeply. This was a nation unto himself. So God was dealing heavily with these prophets. And he will deal severely and heavily with anyone who is preaching or teaching anything other than the truth of his word and the gospel. Many are watering down the word. Amen. Many are not preaching the cross. They're not preaching the blood. They're not preaching the whole counsel of God. And they sound really good, but we really need to be aware of what the Lord is saying and what the word says. And if we're not in the word, we're not going to know it. We're not going to be able to discern today. If you're not in the word, you will not discern the falsehood and what is going on. Now, how do we recognize a false prophet? Just real brief. They may appear to speak God's message, but they do not live according to his principles. So they may sound good, but they're not living a righteous life. They water down the message in order to make it more palatable. They don't want to offend people. They're not going to preach sometimes the hard things. They encourage their listeners often subtly to disobey God. They tend to be arrogant, self-serving, and appealing to the desires of their audience rather than being true to God's word. Arrogance and appealing to the desires of the audience. I'm not here to be liked. I'm not here to preach what people want to hear. I'm here to preach the word of the Lord. And I believe there's a tremendous responsibility to speak from a pulpit or to say prophetically, God has spoken this to me. We need to be Amen. careful. If they had really stood in my counsel, he said again, they would have enabled my people to hear my words. And they would have turned them back from their evil ways and their evil deeds. So we are called of God to witness, to call people to righteousness, to call them out of sin into righteousness lovingly. We're not to condone their sin. We're not to beat them over the head with the Bible either. But we are to tell them, look, this is what the word of the Lord says. <clears throat> and if you aren't in that place, you're not going to go to heaven. You see, this is a great time to opportunity to witness because so many people are dying around us. And it's very sad, you know. So we have to be careful because we're, we're called to share the gospel. There's no guarantee that you're going to be here next week. There's no guarantee I'm going to be here next week. And a lot of people I see are dying and going to hell. Just recently read a, I heard of a man that the family said did not know the Lord. So are we hearing the Lord? Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty said to Jeremiah. Because the people have spoken these words, lies about God would do. I will make my words in your mouth like a fire. And these people, the wood it consumes. It's a message of judgment. I'm going to make your words like fire, he said. You're going to speak my word. Jeremiah had a tough life. He, he had a tough life. If you read the book of Jeremiah, it's, it's kind of difficult, really, because he was in prison. He was beat. He, all kinds of things he had to go through, you know. But he was faithful to speak the word of the Lord. Now, my second point is, it's not my word like fire. God is going to compare his word to the words of the prophets that were spoken. Who, he who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat for nourishment, says the Lord. It's not my word like fire that endures all that cannot endure, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks in peace the rock of the most stubborn results, resistance. It's not my word like fire, he said, and like a hammer that breaks in peace a rock and pulverizes it. That's how strong it is. We'll talk more about the fire. Whereas the words of the prophets were like straw, Shaft. God's word was food that nourishes. Unlike the words of the prophets, which lure with sugar-coated promises, Jeremiah's words sting, they convict, and they were piercing. It's not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. That's a powerful word that will break a rock in pieces. That's the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is fire. It'll pierce, and it will change, and it will burn out the dross. Jeremiah testifies of, to God's be, word being like a fire. If I say I won't mention him, God, or speak any longer in his name, his message comes at fire, becomes a fire burning in my heart, shut up in my bones. I become tired of holding it in, and I cannot prevail. So he is constrained to preach this word and to speak this because it's like a fire burning in him that he knows he has to speak what God has said. This fire burns up the shaft of the utterance of the false prophets. It's a consuming fire that burns up the worst in our lives, the lust, the corruption, the false doctrines. 
It's a forest like a forest fire that consumes houses and trees. For our God is a consuming fire, Hebrews 12, 29. He's a consuming fire. Fire purifies. We all know that it purifies as gold in the fire, you know. And silver, it separates the dross and makes gold and silver pure and whole. And it shows what the metal really is. It also is quick and piercing and penetrating and convicting. Forgive 70 times 7. You see, when we read the word, and I'm going to give you more examples, it tells us exactly what to do and how to live. But, you know, we're so inundated by the culture of the world, yeah. you know, and what they're doing. If we're not in the word, we're just going to go along and just, oh, that's pretty good. That sounds good to me. That's, that sounds good humanistic philosophy, you know. And God said, no, 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 no. I said overcome evil with good. I didn't say get back. I didn't say beat him over the head. I didn't say don't talk to them anymore. He will tell us what to do, but sometimes we don't want to hear it. It, sh it shatters the pride. God's word will pierce our hearts and convict us and convince us like a hammer to judge the thoughts and attitudes of our heart if we're praying for them. In, in exasperation, God declares, when my word is like fire, my word is the only truth. This is the truth, the only truth you are going to get in, in the world today. There is no other truth. I don't care how many good books are reading, and I'm a reader, I read books, I read magazines, articles, I read. but I'll tell you what, I'm careful what I read and what I put in my mind. But this is the greatest truth, the only truth that's going to change us and has strengthened us and give us hope. The word is eternal and gives life and healing. In these scriptures, God is adamantly declaring his word is true and will come to pass much more than the fixed order of the moon and stars. Now listen to this verse, which is so powerful. This is what God is saying about his work. He said, this is what the Lord said, the one who gives the sun for light by day, the fixed order of the moon and stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea and makes its waves war. He puts everything in order, the daytime, the nighttime, the tides. Yahweh of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from my presence, this is the Lord's declaration that also Israel's descendants will cease to be a nation before me. Do you hear how strong that is? If the earth does not rotate, if the tides don't come in and out, if night and day don't come, then that's what's going to seize Israel from being my descendants. And that's not going to happen, he's saying. That's not going to happen. This is what I'm saying, he said. My word is true, it's like fire. So my word that comes to my mouth will not return to me void but will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. For I am the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I shall speak will be performed and come to pass. Ezekiel 12, 25. So whatever God has said in his word is what we believe, is what we hold on to, is what we declare over our lives. Are we doing that? You can't be distraught and depressed. I mean, the statistics I read, because I'm a counselor too, about the depression in our country and the terrible loneliness, isolation, What's happening to people is very, very serious. These people are killing themselves. They're hopeless. But we as believers, we are the light. It doesn't matter how dark it gets. Jesus, the scripture that the Lord's burning in me that I want to preach on is, whoever knows God has overcome the world. Whoever is, is, knows God has overcome the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So I can't be down and out and depressed and miserable. And I'm not saying you won't be depressed or go through something. You know, I lost my son six, five months ago. It's still a struggle. It's still really hard. But because I know God some, because I know him some and want to know him more, because I stand on this word, I am able to trust him that he does all things well in his time and that all things work together for good. Not some platitude that I just say, but something I truly believe. I tell you, brothers and sisters, this word has got to get in you. It can't just be something we go to church and hear. It can't just be something we look at once in a while. It's got to be. And I'm saying this to anyone who hears this in the future, not just people here, because I know I'm preaching to the choir. I'm saying we all have got to be in this word because it's active, alive, and it's very sharp. It will change us. You see, most people don't read the Bible because the enemy doesn't want you to read the Bible. He doesn't want you to hear God's voice. He doesn't want you to hear the word of the Lord. There are a million things to do in life, and believe me, I'm very busy. But because of, um, I know how important this is, I'm going to be in this word. For the word of God is living and active. That's my third point. And very impacting. 
And we know the scripture is sharper than the two-edged sword. It penetrates to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The double-edged sword means both sides are sharpened and can cut both ways. So God's word is sharp, it penetrates into the deepest parts and discerns our innermost thoughts and ideas. God will convict us. Ask him to search you every day. He knows our hearts. That's comforting for me. How comforting that God knows your heart. It doesn't matter who judge you or what they say. That may hurt. But you know deep down what God said. I know you by name. I know you're going in and sitting down, Psalm 139. I know what you're going to say before you say it. And I know your heart. I know your heart. So he judges our attitudes, but he knows our hearts. And we are to overcome evil with good, as I said. He judges if we are lining up with the word of God, whether we're kind, caring, and compassionate, forbearing. These are things we should be walking in as believers. How is the world going to say we're any different if we're not? We take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is God's word. This is the sword of the spirit. That's how powerful it is. It's a sword to destroy things that are in our lives, to give us power, to help us. And that Jesus was vulnerable at the time of fasting. He fasted 40 days. And when Satan came to him, he tempted him with bread. And he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Every word. He knew God's word gives direction. It's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, if you want it to be. God will let us do what we want. But if indeed we want his word to lead and guide us, then it's going to lead and guide us. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I am the Lord God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. Do you believe that? Do we really believe that? Amen. Then we're not wringing our hands. Then we're yielding every day or saying, Lord, you're directing me. It's not about my desires. It's not about what I want to do. You're directing my path. You're showing me what is best. You are a fortress, therefore, for your name's sake. Lead me and guide me. Yes, God wants to do that. We don't lean into our own understanding, but in all our ways we acknowledge God. That's a comforting scripture. Because if we are not leaning on ourselves, we're leaning on him, right? And that's what God wants us to do. So that third person of the Trinity living in us, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, and I want to encourage everyone, if they're not totally committed to Jesus Christ, watching by internet or here, that is the thing you have to do. Today is the day of salvation, that God wants to draw you to him so that the precious Holy Spirit indwells you and he, we are able to be ignited to worship and love and serve God with all our hearts. It's a fire that convicts us. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. That's powerful. That right there, um, a lot of people could struggle over that for weeks, you know, about not being condemned. And the script, one of the scriptures I love so much that I quote is out of Philippians 2.13. God is all the while effectually working in us, creating and energizing in us the power and desire. That's what God says in his word. I'm not doing it. God is creating the desire in me, energizing you and me with a desire to willing to work for his good pleasure, satisfaction, and delight, amplified version. So if we believe that, that's his word then we know we take some pressure off of us. I don't have to do this, God. You're helping me. You're empowering me. You're doing this, God. See, God's word gives faith and hope, right? For with God, nothing is ever impossible. And no word of God is without power or impossible of fulfillment. You cannot have faith if you're not in the word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. You know, and you can't have faith if you don't know the object of your faith, who is God. And how do we know the object of our faith? Through the word. It's amazing. Now, I'm, I'm, I always, I'm just a fanatic about the word. And I don't apologize for that because it's literally igniting my life with hope, with love, with grace, with a, with a passion for God that I race after him. And it was prophesied over me, oh, I don't know, 27 years ago, that I would race after Jesus with the Bible under my hand. I would race that, and it's come to pass. I'm racing after him. I'm passionate for him. And that's what I want us to get to. That the word ignites us so that we are passionate. God is opening our eyes to who he is. It's revelation. It's a great scripture. And see what I do when I read the Bible. Then I go to my journal, my spiritual journal, and I write scriptures out. 
Not every day, but a lot of days, one scripture. What stood out to me today? What was it that really bang? And that was it. And that was one of them. Whoever is, is born of God has victory. He's overcome the world. And that's me. That's me. <laughs> right? So start applying it to you. Now here's a word. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the, act, the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. That's a scripture. That's about God. That's telling you that God, the sun, you know, is the radiance of God's glory. That's powerful. Here's another one. For from of old, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen a God besides you who works and shows himself active on behalf of those who earnestly wait for him. So are you waiting for him? Are you seeking him? I think you are. Then he is waiting to be there for you. He's waiting, earnestly waiting to be active on your behalf. See? But he has his time. So you see, if we truly believe God's word, we're going to be stronger in our faith. We're going to know that we know there's a God in heaven that's hearing me. That this word is true, God. It is, if this word, let me tell you, the prophecies, it's um, unbelievable. You all know that. The prophecies have been fulfilled. There's no way it's a miracle these prophecies have been fulfilled. God's word is true no matter what anybody tells you or what you yourself think, you know. And I love this scripture, too, that I quote quite often. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. That's a powerful scripture. When you start to get weary, when God's asked you to do something, or you're in the middle of a work week and you're weary, God has, God has called you to that. He's given you power, all surpassing powers from him. It is God who arms me with strength that makes my way perfect, and dwelling strength of the Holy Spirit. You know, so these are scriptures that tell us how to know God, how to press into God, and what God is like, see. But if you only hear a message 30 minutes a week, and you might read a little devotional with two scriptures once in a while. You're not going to get much, I'm telling you. The enemy's ferocious. That's not enough. You, we have to feed ourselves the word. And it takes discipline. I'll talk about that in a minute. What do we have to do to get into God's word? Obeying God's words blesses us. You know, he who deals wisely and heeds God's word shall find good. And whoever leans on, trusts, and is confident in the Lord, happy, blessed, and fortunate is he. So guess what? I'm happy, blessed, and fortunate. And so are you. If you're trusting God. No matter what you're going through. No matter how. Uh, you know, what's happening and how you feel. And I've just gone through a tough two weeks. But I rejoice that I know God. His presence was with me. And his word was in me. And I was quoting it too. Oh, Lord of hosts, blessed, happy, fortunate is the man who trusts in you. That's what God says about us. We are fortunate. We are blessed. You can't be down and out if you're quoting these scriptures. And you know that it's true. And he sent his word and healed them. By his stripes, we are healed. We are healed. So, so if you get the idea of what I'm saying, there's a kind of force of the spirit. This word is so powerful. As you read it, it changes you. And it gives you faith and hope. Do we need hope? Amen. We need hope. I don't see much hope in the world. I don't really think it's going to get a lot better. Sure is getting a lot worse. I need hope that Jesus is returning. That if I'm leaving this life by any means, I'm in his presence. That's what he said. To be absent the Lord is to be present. With, if I'm absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. So how do I have hope? Because God said so in his word. I don't conjure it up. I stand on God's word. And the more you know God through the word, the more you're going to trust him and have the faith to believe his word is true. He is not going to force us to read the Bible. He is not going to force us to come close to that is our choice. God gives us that choice. You know. Now, this, here's another scripture that really, um, and, um, let me say this first. Don't read the Bible just to say you read it. Don't read a chapter or read a chapter. No, that's crazy. I'd rather you read. I tell my clients, read two scriptures. Two, if they're open to the Bible. Read two scriptures and make those scriptures come alive. Don't force yourself in some regimen you don't want to do. But make sure you get it in you. Drink it in. It's imperative today. Have a Bible reading plan. There are many, many plans. It's good to have a Bible reading plan. If it's too much to read the Bible in a year, then there's other plans you can do. There's no right or wrong. It's just getting the word in you. And then one of the most important things is to pray prayerfully that God will illuminate his word to us. 
He'll make it come alive to us. That as we're reading it, something will pierce our heart. We will know God is speaking to us. So here's the scripture I've been quoting for three years, three years now. God is able to make all grace abound unto me, so that in all things at all times, having all that I need, I put me in their eye. I will abound into every good work. And I quote that every day. Because I believe it. I believe he's making all grace abound. That's why I'm standing here tonight. It's just God and God alone. And he's going to provide my needs and the needs for the ministry. So those are the scriptures, those kind of things that you can stand on and believe. And Jesus spoke to them again, I am the light of the world. I shared this recently. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And the light of life is Jesus. Now that's powerful. When I read that the other week, I wrote that right in my journal and I got very excited. I said, you know why? Because Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And if you follow me, you're not going to walk in darkness. I don't care how dark it is out there. You have the light of my glory, the light of my presence, and my word. You're walking in that. See, do we believe that? I believe that. I'm walking in the light of his glory, no matter what's going on. He's going to see me through somehow. I've been through a lot in my life. And he is the light of my life. He is the light. God himself. So let the scripture come alive, you know. Uh, another scripture I love is, 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 is a heart, dear penis after the water brook, so panteth my soul after you, O God. I'm hungry, I'm racing after you. You are my portion, Lord, I promise to obey your words. I've sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. Wonderful scriptures in Psalm 119. And I love the one I quoted before. You're aware of all my ways before a word is on my tongue. You know all about it, Lord. You've encircled me. You have placed your hand upon me. Brothers and sisters, if we believe that word, we're going to have peace. We're going to be in our Abba Father's arms. We're going to be sheltered in him. We're going to know that no matter what happens, God has got us. He's got us in the palm of his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. So let's go beyond reading scriptures. Memorize some scripture so it's hid away in your heart. I love to memorize the word. It's not hard to do. You write down the scripture several times, and then you start reading it. Then you start quoting it. And we need to be declaring the word of God over our life anyway, because life and death the, and, and the power of the tongue. The power of life and death is in the tongue. So we need to be declaring the word of the Lord. So I love, and I quote almost everyone, unto you, O God, do I bring my life. I trust, rely, and I'm confident in you. Let not my hope in you be disappointed. Psalm 25. And I forget where this one is, but to the end of my tongue and my heart, everything glorious within me will sing praise to you and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I give thanks to you. It is good for me to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge, that I may tell of all his works. So memorizing scripture is a wonderful way to get the word in you. It doesn't have to be a lot. Until you can, when you are struggling, sometimes when I'm laying in bed at night, something's on my mind, the word of God comes to me. It comes to me, just like that, because I know it. So much of it is in me already, and I'm still drink, drinking it in. You know, but sometimes we can memorize a story to tell. And many of you know Bible stories. Some people don't. So maybe you can't. Be, you're not great at memorizing scripture, but you can memorize a story about Daniel or David or Goliath. You can memorize something to tell. Because uh, it's interesting, uh, someone I, that's been doing my hair for a while, she doesn't know the Bible much at all. But it's interesting how I'm able to uh, share stories out of the Bible with her and scripture. And she doesn't know any of these stories, really. You know, she, it's amazing. You know, people just don't know. But we can share that, you know. So be doers of the word and not just hearers, only deceiving ourselves. I like what Smith Wigglesworth said. Read the word, consume the word until it consumes you. That's what he, I love that. Consume the word until it consumes you. So another way you could do this is ask questions about the passage and read it. What's going on in the passage? Read it in the context. What's going on? What challenges you, jolts, or confuses you about that passage? What does this tell you about the essence of God or the nature of Jesus, which I've been sharing with you already, that God is long-suffering, that God vindicates, you know. Sometimes when we read things in the Bible, we go, I don't really, that seems so much God. Well. He's a God of judgment and he vindicates, so we know we have to trust that. And what concrete action can I take over what I've just read? If I've read my portion for the day, should I repent? Do I forgive someone? Do I search my heart? 
or am I to be, go about doing good and show love? What is it God wants us to do once we read the word? There's something in there for us, right? So if God's word is so powerful and will not return to him void, then are you making it a vital part of your life? A daily vital part of your life? And it's up to you. It's up to me to do that. And anyone listening to my voice, I can promise you, it will change your life. And that's why Satan does not want you to read it. He does not want you to drink it in. He does not want you to quote it. He does not want you to believe it. Because it will give you grace, strength, and hope. And hope. And are we acting on God's word? So, what response do I want from us? Well, to determine to read and meditate on God's word. And that's a personal decision. And I'm sure many of you are reading the word every day. But it shocks me sometimes at the people I hear who are not reading the Bible. They are not into the word every day. You know, making it a daily habit. There are many Bible apps. You know, there are plenty of different kinds of Bibles, versions of the Bible that are easier to read. You know, when you read the Bible, you get to know the God of the Bible. That's why you read it. You don't read it to say, I've read it. You read it to get more faith. You read it to get to know who God is. And for God's word to convict us and to give us faith and hope and peace. Because as we are truly trusting God in this work, we are going to be faithful, hopeful people and loving people, right? We're not going to be mesmerized in the mess that's in this country and all that's going on. We have light in our lives and hope in our lives and a lift in our voice so that people can say, well, what's with you, you know? And how can you feel this way or think that way, you know? Uh, so the word teaches us the nature and attributes of God it teaches us just to review how to live our lives, and it will never return to God void. Never, ever. It gives us hope and faith. So, Jesus, God said, it's not my word like fire, says the Lord, like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. It's our choice. First we make our choices, then our choices make us. So I urge us to choose to ignite your life with the power, hope, and faith of God's word. And making it a daily habit. If you aren't in a habit, I want you to think about. There's a good handout we're going to give you with a lot of scriptures I've, I've shared uh, this evening. And that to make a plan of how, even if it's just two or three scriptures a day. So at least you are in the Word and you know you're being faithful. And then how is that affecting you, Lord? What's going on? So, Lord, we thank you for your Word. We just praise you and thank you. Because your Word is true and it gives us hope and faith. Oh, I praise you, God. It's alive. It comes alive in us, God, as we read it. I thank you for the word. I thank you for the faithful people who penned this word and penned it by the Holy Spirit, God. And you've kept it. It's still the best-selling book in the world, God. That's because it's a supernatural book that you have birthed, Lord. And so we give you all the glory. And I pray, Lord, you would surely put in the heart of everyone who's heard my voice, no matter what way they've heard it that they too will want to be ignited with your word, that they will be hungry to get into the word and make it a real part of their lives, a vital part of their lives. Glorify your name, Lord, and powerfully minister, I pray, in the mighty name of Jesus. Mighty name of Jesus. Praise you.